Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, some uh, some of our research at the Shower Hypogeum um, in the Maltese Islands. Before I start, I'd like to quickly mention that I do have a stutter, which sometimes causes me to have breaks in my speech, so please bear with me on that. So, late Neolithic Malta spans the period of about 3,800 to 2,300 BC, and this is the point in time when Malta takes a very divergent and unique archaeological course. At this time, we see the development of very distinctive megalithic architecture, really sophisticated art, but also um, very complex mortuary sites. And this has sort of previously been explained as either being the result of physical isolation, cultural insularity, or perhaps related to a strong island identity. But another very important uh, question in the Maltese context is how did they manage to maintain this complex culture of megalithic building? And especially whenever we know that these people were up against increasingly difficult circumstances. And the radiocarbon evidence, you can see here, the density models really reflect this sort of fluctuation in human activity and these difficult circumstances. So just talking about the shower hypogeum specifically, this is a large mortuary complex set within a natural cave system, which was then elaborated with megalithic architecture. And as they constructed this space, you can have or rather, we see discrete areas and discrete burial places. And this is a map of the site, and it sort of shows you how sort of, there are these areas of dense burial activity, and these dense commingled burial deposits, which also act as structural deposits. So, in terms of time, this uh, this phase of the site kicks off at around about 3000 BC, but you can see that there's a peak of activity at around about 2500 BC. <clears throat> So I'm going to be talking about um, our re-evaluation of the excavation archive, whereby we digitize the contact sheets in GIS. And again, I, I emphasize the fact that we're dealing with these uh, deposits of dense, disarticulated human remains. And I really want to impress here um, that, that my part of the talk is coming at this from a very much archaeological perspective. Um, Commingled human remains are so sensitive to intentional and unintentional manipulation. And if you think about your average archaeological deposit, you have a matrix and a few bits of pottery, and that doesn't actually really tell us a lot. If we think about the deposits that we have on this site, you have your archaeological matrix that is round, full of tiny little fragments of bone, each one sensitive to being moved either intentionally or unintentionally. So using that, commingled deposits actually become a really powerful indicator of site formation processes. So the area that we're going to focus on today is the shrine zone, and this is a part of the site where we have this large stone bowl and some other important architectural features, namely a megalithic shield that runs around the site, or uh, that runs around the area. And what, what we have here is that we're going to um, do some density analysis, so you can sort of see how there are this changing ex expansion and contraction throughout uh, the site's history. What's also really unique about this area is that we have, it's pretty much the only place in, in the site where we have these uh, really nice burial stratigraphy. And this section here also shows how these megalithic, or how this megalithic architecture is actually situated right on top of the human bones. So they're building these structures on top of the dead. So after the first placement of burials, at around about 2800 BC on the bedrock. We then get expansion of burial activity across the bedrock, but we also have the evidence for the first remodeling event where we actually see that they're actually cutting into the burial deposit to lay a foundation for one of these megalithic structures. Burial activity after that becomes very rapid, so we get rapid de deposition of human remains that build up within the area demarcated by this uh, megalithic screen. But this rapid burial activity continues, and then we eventually see that actually burial activity overflows up around these existing structures, which then prompts a second re re remodeling event, whereby they have to rip out these megaliths and reposition them. So again, this sort of trend of expansion and contraction uh, really again shows the, the power of thinking of commingled deposits as a whole as these really, really powerful indicators of site formation process. But also this process of continuous remodeling 
echoes what we see in above ground architecture where we also have this sort of these layers and this constant remodeling this constant need to maintain this space and um and to sort of keep these sites in use and uh, functional and i'll pass on to jeff who's going to talk about more fine-grained taphonomy Okay, so how do we interpret post-mortem interaction at the site? Well, I've been working on a taphonomic um, analysis of a small sample of the remains. There's over 200,000 bones on this site, and I've looked at maybe about 10% of the total assemblage, but I think that the total assemblage is already a conservative estimate. Now, taphonomy is really well-placed for looking at funerary practices over time, and one of the key methods I've employed is relative element representation. So this takes... Um, the minimum number of elements for each skeletal element uh, in the body um, and um, calculates it against the total number of expected elements if the minimum number of individuals in a context were to be present and fully represented. And what we can see here is that for sites with primary deposition, uh, such as Spitalfields and Penta, you get quite a high representation of most elements in the skeleton, except for those with a lot of trabecular bone, which are nearly always underrepresented. And then when we look at Neolithic sites with really complex collective deposition, multiple forms of deposition happening in the same space, you get a really irregular, uneven, unpredictable um, representation of all elements of the skeleton. And now ideally, this model of element representation should be contextualized by looking at modification to the surface of the bone and also by looking at excavation records to try and pin down the particular types of funerary practices that we can see from the deposits. So this is what I've been looking at at the Shower Circle. Um, and what I've done is divided the skeleton into three main types of bones. Long bones, um, the skull, cranium and mandible, um, and residual bones, so the small bones of the hand and feet and also of the axial skeleton. And I've taken the bone from each of these types, which is represented highest, and put it into this turning plot. And what you can see is we've got some contact with a really high curation of types of bones. So we've got cranial curation, we've got long bone curation, but we've also got this cluster in the middle where most elements of the skeleton are quite evenly represented. And I don't think that this indicates um, complete articulated skeletons staying in the same place, not being disturbed, um, excavation records say otherwise. And in fact, what I think this is suggesting is that we've got multiple different types of practices happening in the same space, which lead to this sort of similar signature. This might be primary deposition, but also different forms of secondary practices happening in the same space. And what I'd like to draw your attention to here is that where I've looked at specific areas with sequences over time, the dominant practices are also changing over time. And these contexts in red are what I think represent multiple depositional modes. Um, and two of the, uh, one of these is located in the shrine, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more in relation to what Owen has just been telling you. So the two contacts from the shrine which I've looked at are 960, the overlying contact, and 1206 in the middle. And in 1206, you can see that we've got fewer lower limb bones than upper limb bones, and I think this represents selective removal of these elements to somewhere else in the site, most likely. Um, and this indication from the um, element representation model is also borne out by the excavation records and by looking at articulations in the laboratory. And then in contact 960, the overlying layer, where the site is becoming increasingly crowded and requiring a lot of management in order to keep using this area because it's literally overflowing with bones, um, what we get is an overrepresentation of small bones of the hands and feet. You can see particularly here we've got a lot of metacarpals and metatarsals. One interpretation of this is that they could be selective dumps of small bones, but I think that's quite unlikely. I think actually what's happening is that we've still got primary deposition continuing in this area, but because it's literally overflowing with bone, what they're doing is removing the largest bones from the centre of the site, um, pushing them most likely into the niches, into more inaccessible areas of the site in order to keep reusing the central area. Um, and just to draw your attention to... Uh, the last context here, 783, is similar to 1206 um, and goes back to my point about this irregularity and low representation of elements um, as a result of multiple practices happening. So just to draw this together um, with the remodelling events that Owen's been looking at, similar practices are happening in the shrine 
over a long length of time, but we see a decreasing number of individuals left in articulation. Um, and what we see is a reduction of the body, um, the, the skull or the cranium being removed and the long bones being removed. And occasionally the axial skeleton remains in articulation and then sometimes it's disturbed. And the visibility of, this, of these practices is quite difficult to get at through the excavation records, but I think it fluctuates over time as to whether they are disturbed or not. And most likely also relates to these events of remodeling, which Owen was just talking about. So what we've done here is tried to put together a multi-scalar analysis. And I think this is quite important as it allows you to complement a fine-grained understanding of the human remains, which I've been doing through taphonomy, and to contextualize it against the broader picture of what was happening in Neolithic Malta at this time. So the continuous remodeling mirrors what we've seen in the upstanding architecture, seen, um, for example, at Santa Verna Temple, which is nearby. And this expansion and contraction of remodeling follows changing trends and depositional modes over time, as I've just said. But these remodeling events are interventions with the dead themselves. They are literally excavating trenches into the deep deposits of human remains to uproot the megaliths, place them over um, the highest level, and to keep reusing the center of the site in the same way that they were doing before. And what I found through taphonomy is that they don't seem to have been moving the bones outside of the site. So I would argue that the remains of the dead formed a protected and respected resource within the site. Now, whether you would like to call them ancestors or not, I think that they were a powerful resource for the community and that managing the dead was really important to maintaining the use of the site over time. And it overflowed towards the end of its use. And what we've seen is that this is roughly contemporary with the radiocarbon dates for increasing environmental stress, uh, degrading soils, for example. Um, and what they're doing, this um, consistent elaboration and intensification of funerary practices indicates a persistence of place even in the face of distress and perhaps is one form of response to this environmental stress. Thank you.